Well, let me say officially welcome to you today. Welcome to those that are joining us online. And great to be back. Now, we were away in far north Queensland last week. It was fantastic. The sun was shining. The kids were swimming. We just enjoyed hanging out together as a family. And one of the things that we did last Friday was uh, we headed to a place called Fitzroy Island. Now, if you don't know where that is, it's about 45 minute ferry ride um, from Cairns. And there's beaches where you can swim. There's a reef on which you can snorkel and other activities uh, for, uh, for the family to undertake. So you'll see there on the screen, that's what it looks like from last week for uh, the Heinsen family. Yes, very hard to take in, indeed, yes. So we did a day trip to Fitzroy Island. And when I booked this day trip, I had this kind of image for how I thought the day would go. All right, so you see the picture and you think that's idyllic. Surely here's how the day is going to proceed. And, you know, it was a little bit like this. The seas would be smooth and calm. The sun would be shining. The sand would be white. The kids would be enjoying themselves. And maybe, just maybe, mum and dad could get a moment or two together and just enjoy each other's company and the idyllic location that we found ourselves in. That was my ideal vision for the day. You probably don't need to know, or I don't need to tell you, that the reality was just a little bit different. So I want to take you on a journey this morning. I'm sorry I couldn't take you all to Cairns. Family budget won't allow that. <laughs> Hard enough for all of us to get there. Um, but, you know, you see the, the photos online or you see the tourist brochures and it looks so ideal, doesn't it? You know, when I put that on the screen, I just heard people, oh, you know, because it's that idyllic thing, you know, that we aspire to. The water's glistening, but it's not real. So our journey to Fitzroy Island actually started as I thought it would. Now, we didn't have a rental car on this trip, so in order for us to get from where we were staying into town to the reef terminal, we had to get on the bus. Now, the buses in Cairns are reliably unreliable. So anyone that lives there will tell you that. So I was a bit, you know, because the boat's not gonna wait for us, we have to get there at a certain time. But fortunately, the bus was on time, we got on, and some bus drivers in Cairns aren't taking cash. So if you go to pay with cash, they're like, no, we're not taking cash, just off you go. So it's a nice, cheap way to travel if you get a generous bus driver. Um, so we got into town, we arrived at the terminal, and everything was going exactly as, as planned. And we hopped on the boat. Now, last time we went out to the reef, I think a couple of the kids got a bit seasick. But fortunately, this time, everyone was pretty good. It was only a 45-minute ferry ride. The seas weren't too rough. So we got to Fitzroy Island and there were no problems, at least not yet, because the day had just started, may I remind you. From that point onwards, we got lost. There were injuries. The wind on this idyllic beach was blowing a gale and what should have been a nice warm day actually turned out being a little bit chilly. The kids said the water was cold. That was enough for me not to venture anywhere near the water. The food and drink ran out. There were disagreements amongst the siblings. And there were a lot of other people on this beach. And can I, in a very kind and loving way, say that one or two of them were just a little bit creepy? That's all I'm going to say. All right. So by the end of the day, here's what had happened. The kids were tired. They were hungry and thirsty. I don't know how my kids eat so much, I've got to tell you. It's like they're constantly eating, but they're always hungry and they're always thirsty. Um, I heard the phrase, I'm bored, just a little bit too much. I'm thinking, hold on a minute. You're on a tropical island in North Queensland in the sunshine. How can you be bored? Apparently, they were bored. And to top it all off, a couple of us, myself included, got quite sunburnt from being in the North Queensland sun for that day. By the time the ferry got there, we were all ready to go home, all right? Now, I want you to hear me and I want you to hear me very clearly. We had a fantastic day at Fitzroy Island. I'm not complaining about it because I know how blessed we are to be there and to have that experience because it's such an important thing for us as a family to make sure our kids are 
experiencing things during their childhood. We thoroughly enjoyed our time. We absolutely did. But the point of the story, and this is what's going to lead into my message today, is that there's a difference between how we thought our trip was going to go and how the trip actually went. Okay, so there's that difference. And so what I want to do today is I want to bring you the first of a two-part message, which I'm just calling IRL. Now, if you're a young person, you would know that IRL stands for in real life. Turn to your neighbour and say in real life, because I can see some of you, and maybe online you're with us as well, some of you are going, what on earth is IRL? In real life is what it actually stands for. And as I reflected upon our trip to Fitzroy Island, it actually occurred to me that there's this disconnect or there's this gap between what is the ideal and what is the real. Okay, there's a gap between what's ideal and what is real. And so I wanna speak into that today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your church, Lord God. I thank you that you are always speaking. I thank you, Lord God, that no matter circumstances we go through, no matter journeys we go through, that you are always with us. You're always guiding us and you're always speaking through that. And I pray today, Lord God, that these words that I speak, I pray that they are words of encouragement. I pray, Lord God, um, that they are words that challenge and I pray that they are words that mould and shape us to become more and more like you, Jesus. And we thank you so very much to be able to represent you in your mighty and precious name, we pray. Amen. So I think we can agree that we've all had one or more IRL experiences. If you're married, you probably had an IRL experience. I don't think it's just me who had this picture of what marriage could look like. Now, I see some husbands and some wives who are sitting together, tapping each other and smiling and going, I know exactly what he's talking about. But you know like when you first get married and you think everything's going to look like this. It's all going to be perfect. It's going to be the white sand beach on the tropical island. But then after a little while, there's disagreements. Or there's, you know, you're thinking one thing, they're thinking the other thing. And you soon realise that marriage actually takes a lot of work. That it takes a lot of forgiveness. It takes commitment. It takes compromise. It takes so much more. So the ideal and the real are very, very different. Let me bring it back to our walk with Jesus. The ideal sometimes when it comes to reading our Bible can be this. I'm going to get up at five o'clock in the morning. I'm going to spend two hours reading the Word of God. I'm going to be in His presence. I'm going to enjoy that. He's going to speak to me. I'm going to get a lot out of it. What can the real sometimes be? You're scrambling for five or ten minutes because of work, because of kids, because of grandkids, because your husband or your wife interrupts, whatever it might be, I don't know. But there's a difference between what the real is and what the ideal is. Let's talk about our prayer life. Who... (laughs) Who, when they go to pray, is praying full of faith and full of expectation? And you do that, and that's how you start when you first become a new Christian. I love being around people that have just found Jesus as their Lord and Saviour, because they're like those little energetic dogs that just jump and, and yap all the time. That's what they're like. But then you know what happens? And it happens to all of us. Sometimes we pray and we're full of faith and we're full of expectation and our prayer doesn't get answered like we thought it would. And so we go, okay. And then that happens again and again and again. And do you know what happens? The ideal, the ideal which is we pray and God answers our prayer, we're full of expectation. The real of that comes, we pray not full of expectation, but full of hope. We hope that God might hear us. We hope that he might answer our prayer. Our expectation has become hope, and they're two very different things. Can you see the disconnect between the ideal and the real? There's a gap in what we experience and what we would like to experience. So for the rest of our time together today, I want to take a journey through the book of Acts. 
All right. As I said, this is going to be uh, going to continue this message next week. If you got your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts 13. We're going to look at Paul because Paul, I think, as we'll see today, experiences the ideal. But as we'll see more next week, the real looks very different than the ideal that Paul actually had. So Acts 13 is um, where we're going to be. Now, let me just give you a summary for, um, for the sake of, so that we know where we're at, because it's very important that we understand that. So Paul, of course, was previously known as Saul. Now, in order to not confuse you, I am just going to refer to him as Paul this morning. In the passage, it might say Saul, but it's the same person. We're also going to talk about John Mark, who is the same person today as well. I don't know why people have to have more than one name. I've got enough trouble remembering one person's name without giving them a second name to actually think about. But so Paul, known as Saul, started his life as a persecutor of Christians. Okay, and um, I think it is Acts 7, we read about the stoning of Stephen. And at the start of Acts 8, it says there was a young man there by the name of Saul who was holding the coats of those that were doing the stoning. So he has witnessed the stoning of Stephen. And then the Bible tells us that he's very excited to go out and to persecute Christians from that point on. Yet God gets a hold of Paul on the road to Damascus. He has this fantastic encounter with God. And his life is turned around 180 degrees. He no longer is the same person again. He went from a persecutor of Christians to a follower of Christ. He went from somebody not only who was following Christ, he then actually became a staunch advocate for the gospel and spent the rest of his life declaring the gospel of Christ. Such a dramatic transformation. And let me just detour quickly and say this. If you have somebody in your life, I'm sure a lot of us do, who is a long way from Jesus right now, and you don't know if they're going to find their way to him, let Saul slash Paul be an encouragement to you. Nobody is too far from God. Nobody is too far away to run into those loving arms of the Father to receive his grace, to receive his forgiveness and to receive salvation in Jesus. I don't care who it is. I don't care where they are. I don't care what they've done because God doesn't care about any of that. He's just interested in them. He loves them unconditionally. All right? So Acts 13 is where we start to see the beginning of Paul's public ministry. Now, anyone who starts out in a new job in ministry has this ideal of what it's going to look like. So I've said previously, we are all ministers of the gospel. So we should all be out in the community telling people about Jesus. Those with us online, you should be doing that as well, wherever you're joining us from. So what does that ideal look like? That ideal looks like you go up to somebody, you say, hi, my name's Wayne. How are you? Do you know about Jesus? Oh, you don't. All right, let me tell you about him. And so you tell the gospel story and the, and the ideal is that they're weeping and they're like, oh, what do I have to do to receive Jesus? And you're like, well, I can pray for you right now. And so you pray with them and they become a Christian and then they, life turns 180 degrees and they're like that little bouncing, yapping dog. That's the ideal, isn't it? That's what we'd all love to see happen. Does it happen like that? No. What's it look like IRL in real life? What does it look like? Oh, hi, my name's Wayne. Can I tell you about Jesus? No, I'm not interested, mate. Off you go. Oh, hi, my... No, no, don't, no, don't mind whatever it is you've got. You've got to even get your name out. But can you see that even when it comes to ministry... Even when it comes to what we're called to do as the church representing Jesus, there is this disconnect. But Paul has this idea of what ministry should look like. And for Paul, it all starts out pretty well. It does. As we journey through, we'll actually see that. He's hanging out with some other believers at a church in Antioch. 
they're worshipping and they're fasting, and then the Holy Spirit speaks. Acts 13.2, here's what it says. Here's what he says, the Holy Spirit. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So here is where Paul is called into full-time ministry. He's with Barnabas, they're called into full-time ministry. At this point, what happens is the believers lay hands on Paul and Barnabas and they get sent out. They say, off you go, go and do what you've been called to do. Can we pause for a moment? And I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine what Paul is thinking at this point. If we go back to Acts 9, Paul's had just a little tease, a little taste of what ministry can look like. It's Acts 9, it's verses 28 through to 31. He's in Jerusalem and he's been able to share the gospel a little bit. So he's had a little taste. But now he's getting called into full-time ministry. God is calling him into full-time ministry. He's seen the mighty hand of God at work in his own life. On the road to Damascus, Paul was blind. And then he regained his sight miraculously. So Paul has seen God at work. He's had a taste of ministry. Everything's going according to plan for Paul. The ideal of what Paul thinks his life should look like and the real of what it's looking like at this point of time, they're matching up. They're exactly the same. And for the rest of Acts 13, everything's pretty good for Paul. I've got to tell you, he travels to many places. He's proclaiming the word of God in the synagogues. Many people are coming to receive Jesus. It's absolutely going fantastically well. There's, I think it's verse 12. There's this great um, interaction that Paul has at a place called Paphos. Paul and Barnabas are summoned by the Roman proconsul. His name is Sergius Paulus. Everyone say Sergius Paulus for me. Look, if I've got to say some of these names and they're hard to say, I'm going to get you to say some of them as well. I'm not going to make a fool of myself. I'm going to make a fool of all of us. Anyway, he's the proconsul and he's responsible for the entire province and he answers to the Roman Senate. So that's who he is, Sergius. He wanted to hear the Word of God. And so he requests for Paul to come. But in that process, he also sees God's power at work through Paul. And so in verse 12, here's what it says. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. So not only is Paul impacting the Gentiles, not only is Paul impacting those that are going to synagogue, now he's actually starting to have influence in the governmental area. It's all going pretty good for Paul, would we say? Well, can we agree on that? I think it's going pretty good for him. I'd be very happy. Acts 13, 44. Here's another example for you. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. The whole city, almost the whole city is there. A few verses later, the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. Paul and Barnabas knocking it out of the park. They're hitting it for six. They're, I don't know what the rugby league metaphor would be. I'm not a rugby league person. They're kicking a goal. See, I'm an AFL man. They're kicking a goal. You just insert whatever sporting metaphor you want there. Ultimately, they are doing very, very well. In Acts 14, they head to a place called Iconium. And there's lots of miraculous signs. There's lots of wonders that are being experienced by people. More and more people are hearing the gospel. Here's what it says. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. This is a pattern that continues itself over and over and over again in Acts 13. In places like Lystra, Pisidia, Pamphylia, Perga, and Attilia, these are some of the places that are mentioned where Paul and Barnabas go. 
So eventually what happens is they go back to Antioch. They go back to the church and they give a report and they speak to the church about all the wonderful things that God has been doing through them. Now that's a very, very quick journey through Acts 13 and 14. I'm not here to spoon feed you when it comes to that. I would encourage you to go through and read that because it's very encouraging when it comes to what God is doing through Paul. Remember where he's come from and now where he is. Okay, so I want us to skip forward to Acts 16 because what we've done is we've set up today that everything was going really, really good for Paul. Everything was looking ideal like he thought that it should be. But things are about to change. He's stepped off the ferry, he's got onto the island, and things are about to change. Now, of course, that's later in Acts when Paul's on the boat, but we're not going there. That's not this story. But it's almost like this kind of honeymoon period that Paul has had when it comes to his public ministry, that it's starting to change. And there's that drift, that gap between the ideal and the real. Now it starts when Paul and Barnabas have a bit of a disagreement. There's a bit of argy-bargy about this man called Mark, whose name is also John. Let's just call him John Mark for the sake of it. So they can't resolve the difference that they are having. And so Paul and Barnabas agree to go their separate ways. Barnabas goes with John Mark and Paul teams up with Silas and they continue on this ministry journey. They go to Syria, Sicilia and to other places. So right now, I'm wondering, how's Paul going? What's he thinking? Hmm, not going as I thought it was. I thought Barnabas and I, I thought we were like this. I thought, you know, we were in ministry together. I thought we were going to do the journey together. But things are starting to change. And can I just say, for you and for me, there will always be a time when we start to drift from the ideal. Sometimes that's a quick drift and sometimes that's a slow drift. But that's going to happen in our life. When the road we're travelling no longer feels like it's the right one. When that ideal image we have looks nothing like the reality of the, the journey that we're on at this point of time. When obstacles and circumstances can get us to a place where we actually start to question not only where we are, but where we are going. And we need to be really, really careful when we get to those seasons. Because when we get to those places, here's what we need to do. We need to double down on the word and the promises of God. We can't freak out We need to go back to God because if he has spoken something to us, we hold on to that, we hold on to it tightly. It's so very important that we actually do that, no matter what's going on around us, no matter how bumpy the road might be, and I'll talk more about that next week. When that happens, here's the thing that we need to do. We need to stay on the right path. Stay on the right path. If you're taking notes today, underline right. Not just stay on the path, stay on the right path. Now, when we landed on Fitzroy Island, I knew already that getting the five o'clock ferry back to Cairns was going to be too long a day for us as a family. So I had to go to the reception and I wanted to change to get to the three o'clock ferry. So Cohen came with me because he's the hyperactive four-year-old that will get into trouble somewhere. So I said, you come with me. And I sent Jackie and the other five kids along to go to this beach. It's a beach called Nudie Beach. I know what you're thinking. I got no idea why it's called Nudie Beach, but I will tell you that everybody on that beach had some form of clothing on, particularly myself. (laughs) All right. So shortly after I send Jackie off, she sends me a text message. She says, I don't know where I'm going. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know where I'm going either. But she says, I don't know where I'm going. But in my head, I thought, if you just stay on the path, 
you'll be okay. If you just stay on the path, the path that's got a random sign every now and again that says nudie beach this way, stay on that path, like it's one of those bush tracks, so you know, it's not concrete and everything, but stay on that and you'll be okay. That's what I'm thinking in my head. Eventually you'll find the beach. But then I start to think, but what if she doesn't? What if she doesn't stay on the right path? Because there's a couple of detours that you can take along the way. What if she takes one of those? And so I start to create this picture in my head of my wife and my five kids lost on a deserted island, living off coconuts, drinking seawater, never to be seen again. Okay, that could be an exaggeration. Fitzroy Island is only three kilometres squared and there's about like eight ferries a day that go there, so I'm sure they would have found them. But the thing is, had she left the path at any time, they would have become lost. All they needed to do was to stay on the right path and eventually they found the beach because they stayed on the right path. And so we see in our passage today that this is something that Paul had to do as well. He had to make decisions about staying on the path that God had set aside for him, that God had planned for him. Because in verse 6, we read something that I find very intriguing. It says, Paul and his companions travelled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Having been kept by the Holy Spirit. So Paul has strengthened the churches in the region and then he wants to go to Asia Minor. So we would know that as modern day Turkey, if you're looking on a map. Paul's desire, Paul's ideal is to get to the city of Ephesus. That's where he wants to go. That's what's in Asia Minor. But the Holy Spirit actually stops him from going there, even though Paul's desire was to go and preach the gospel in this city of Ephesus. Don't you find that interesting? That God would stop Paul from doing what we think is normally something good. Is preaching the gospel. That's a good thing. Can we agree on that? Online, can we agree on that? Preaching the gospel, declaring the name of Jesus, that's a good thing. So why is it then that the Holy Spirit stops Paul? Is not Matthew 28, 19, Acts 1, 8, Mark 16, 15, all of the great commission verses that tell us to go and to declare the gospel, to make Jesus known, are we not called to do that? Is Paul not called to do that? If so, why is it that the Holy Spirit is stopping him from going to the place that he thinks he is called to go? All of those great commission verses, absolutely they're relevant for Paul, for you, for me. But it has to always be the Spirit of God that directs us. The Spirit of God has to direct us. He is the one that creates a path for you and I to travel along according to His master plan that we don't have the blueprints for. We don't know what, what's going on. And so that's why it's so very important for us to make sure that we stay on the right path. I've said it many times before. We're not all called to the same place to undertake the same ministry. But we are all called to be on the right path that God has for us. Proverbs 3 verse 6 puts it this way. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. His will and he will show you the right path to take. Okay? Let's remember that. For Paul, he wasn't the right person in the right place at the right time. It wasn't his moment to go to Asia Minor and to share the gospel. 
Did Paul get to Ephesus? Absolutely he did. But that was the path that he took when God had appointed that time for him to take that path. Ephesus for Paul would come later, not in this passage that we are reading right now. And that's why the timing of God is so very important for you. It's very important for me. We have to make sure that we are aligned with the timing of God. Here's what Habakkuk 2 has to say about it. But these things I plan won't happen right away. I'm a I'd really love it to happen right now kind of person. Slowly, steadily, surely. Slowly, steadily, surely. That's not human nature, really, but that's the nature of God. The time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. If it seems slow, do not despair, for these things will surely come to pass. Just be patient. Turn to your neighbour very lovingly and tell them, just be patient. (laughs) Just be patient. They will not be overdue a single day. The timing of God is perfect. The plans of God are perfect. The path that God has you on right now is perfect. Might not feel like it. We'll see more next week. Paul is tested again, though, just a short time after. So he's not allowed to go to Ephesus. The Holy Spirit blocks him. And then in verse 7, let's read what happens. They come to the border of Mysia. They tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Hold on. Paul can't get to Ephesus. So now he goes, all right, let's change tack, let's change course. We'll go to this place, Bithynia, but once again, the Spirit of Jesus isn't allowing him to go to this place. As I was studying this week, I'm reading it, I'm getting frustrated for Paul at this point of time. I'm like, poor Paul, he just wants to go and tell people about Jesus. And God's stopping him here and stopping him there. Why? What's going on? What's the reason for it? And maybe, maybe that happens for you. I know it's definitely happened in my life as well. I thought I'm going where God wanted me to go. And then I'm stopped from going there. I'm like, oh, okay, must have got that wrong. Sorry, Jesus. Where do you want me to be? Oh, you want me to be here? Okay, you head down that path. And he stops you there as well. And you start to think, What's going on? What's happening? Things aren't happening like I thought they would. It's at that point of time that you have to stay close to God. You can't, I'd encourage you not to get to the point where you start to question God and what he's doing, where you start to blame him, where you start to walk away or drift away, because sadly that's what happens. Some followers of Jesus just drift away because their plan doesn't look like God's plan for their life. And so they start to go, I'm chasing the ideal image for what I think my life should look like. That's not a surrendered life. That's not a surrendered heart. That's only going to lead you into the bush where you have to survive on rainwater and coconuts. Instead, what we see in Paul is we see the process that we should take. Paul is such a great example for us. Things aren't working out now for him as he thought they would be. By now he thought he'd be in Ephesus preaching up a storm, but he's not. He's not. He's still stuck there. So what did Paul do? Did Paul have a bit of a dummy spit and a bit of a whinge? No. He got into the presence of God. He went back to God and he said, what is it that you actually have for me? If it's not A, if it's not B, where am I supposed to go? And in verse 8, we see that. They passed by Mysia and they went to Troas. They went to Troas. Now, Troas is part of Macedonia. This was never Paul's plan. At best, 
This was his third option. It wasn't option one, it wasn't option two. At best, it's his third option to head to Troas. He wanted to go to Ephesus, but he was blocked from doing that. It was Paul's third choice, but can I tell you, it was always God's first choice for Paul. It was always God's first choice for Paul. And we're gonna unpack this a little bit next week and we'll see why that was. Because there's something very important that happens in Macedonia that impacts Paul's life and Paul's ministry from that time forward. But more than that, that impacts your life and my life. And it all takes place because Paul chose to stay on the right path that God had for him. This is like the cliffhanger moment, you know. We should go to a commercial break or, you know, continuing next week, you know, that kind of thing. But Paul was guided by hindrance. God stopped Paul from doing something and that's how he was guided. Sometimes we think God closes a door and that's a negative. That he's closing a door on something because of something that we've done or something we haven't done. Can I just tell you that if God is closing doors, sometimes it's because he's redirecting you and keeping you on the right path rather than allowing you to wander and get lost. And I reflected, you know, this week when it comes to, um, you know, the, the new building for church, you know, I've asked a lot of questions of God, you know, well, why didn't we get that building, you, you know, and those sort of conversations, you know, and quite literally, he closed the door, you know, on a building that we thought was set aside for us. And so I've had to get to the place of um, overcoming the disappointment and going, if he's closed that door, there's a reason for it. And it must mean that there's something better. And so we wait for the God thing. I don't want to settle for us as a church just having a good thing. I want to make sure it's the God thing. Can we agree on that this morning? The God thing. Think about this. Scottish missionary David Livingston wanted to go to China but spent his ministry life in Africa, made a great, great difference. The English missionary, William Carey, wanted to go to Polynesia, but ended up in India. The Australian missionary, Wayne Heinsohn, never wanted to go to India or Thailand or Sri Lanka or any of the places that we've served God on the mission field but that was his plan and his path for us. And so we were just obedient to that. So let's church agree not to be disappointed, not to, be felt, to feel let down when something is blocked, when God blocks something, because he is keeping us on the path that he has for us. Yes, the ideal and the real might look very, very different. It might be very different than we envisaged, but there's always a reason why God diverts us from the path that we think we should be taking. God's plan all along was to get Paul to Macedonia. And next week we'll see why that was. I want to just say this. Maybe there's something you're pursuing that you're desperately pursuing that is not a bad thing, but it's just not the thing that God has for you right now. Maybe it's not the right time. Maybe it's not the right place. Maybe you're not the right person. It's difficult, but there's freedom when you let go of that and you give that back to God and you say, okay, well, what exactly is it that you have for me? What is it that you want for me? We see in Paul's journey a complete responsiveness and obedience to the Holy Spirit. He is obedient to God all the way through. He follows the leading of God. He's willing to lay down his own will so that 
he can follow the path that the Holy Spirit had for him. So he sets aside Ephesus. He sets aside the other place that starts with B, whose name I can't remember right now, but I know that you remember it, so that's okay. I wonder if we're willing to do likewise. I wonder if you're willing to do likewise. Are you willing to follow the path that Jesus has laid out for you, no matter what it looks like, no matter how rocky it gets, no matter the cost, no matter if it fits in with your plans, are you willing to do that? Because when we do that, the journey can sometimes be rough and we'll see next week. I'll tell you about the path to Nudie Beach. It wasn't a nice, easy path. And I had a sore leg at the time. I've got to tell you. So we'll talk more about that next week. It might look different than you thought it would. But when we get to the destination that God has planned for us, that's when the reward actually takes place. For our family last week on Fitzroy Island, it was a beautiful place full of white sand beaches, warm tropical waters, abundant fish and coral life. Our journey to get there didn't look like what I thought it would look like, but we are so very, very thankful and feel so very blessed to have experienced it in real life. I'll leave you with a phrase that I want you to ponder as we finish today. Expecting the ideal in real life is unrealistic. In brackets, this side of heaven. Mm-hmm.